Hello, my name is Kirk Sherman. I'm the Deputy Program Manager of the International Space Station Program. Uh, I have actually been in this position for about seven years, and so during this, the, the, the final uh, transition from shuttle, um, I was the Deputy Program Manager of the International Space Station. Uh, really, when we first uh, started finally working that transition, I was also the ISS Mission Management Team uh, Chairman, so I have experience in both those areas uh, as we were transitioning away from the shuttle to, uh, to other uh, providers to support the International Space Station. The United States announced that it was going to cancel or retire the shuttle program, and so we were communicating that to the partners. There, at that time, the the major elements, the modules that uh, ESA and uh, JAXA, in particular, uh, were to fly, had not flown. They were sitting in, on the ground in the Kennedy Space Center, and their first thought was, "Am I going to get to fly my module? Uh, what does it really mean to us?" So we conveyed that we would still fly those missions. Uh, we were reworking our program, the International Space Station program, to make sure we knew exactly how many flights it was going to require the shuttle to uh, uh, before before it retired, and and so it was really initially concerned: how do we fly our modules, and then what does it mean to the long term to the International Space Station and our our agreements? And so we spent a lot of time working with them uh, to understand their concerns, and also working back with. NASA administration and the shuttle program to make sure that we address their concerns. The, the, the big concern that all the partners had initially was what, what, what does it mean to me? And we really started off with saying, hey, this is going to be, the, the, the shuttle program is going to be retired, we're going to fly so many flights and we're going to, uh, to make sure that we accommodate your needs. I think that went pretty well. I think they appreciated that. Um, and so uh, the, the really the lesson learned, I think, is to, to communicate one-on-one -on -one with them at, at the appropriate levels and, and listen to what they have to say. Um, they understand that we have constraints as well and, and work through those constraints. So by the time we got to this point in the International Space Station program, uh, we'd been through, we'd been actually through the, the Columbia accident, and that really, that accident itself and, and really how the ISS continued after that um, really brought the partnership close together. And so we were actually at a great place as a partnership when, when NASA announced it was going to retire the space shuttle program. And so I think we just, we, we lived off of that. The, we, we had this great communication. We were all pulling together. Um, our partners knew at that point in time that as the shuttle was retired that we would pull together to, to have a viable program, a meaningful program as we went along and to meet our international commitments. So uh, I think the big thing is communication. Um, mul you know, multiple times and building that trust. And th that's, the, that's the real key, I think, uh, going forward for, for people in the future is build that trust, have open communication, listen. And, uh, and I think we were pretty successful doing that in this program. So after the, uh, the uh, Columbia accident, um, uh, the way the shuttle program was to, uh, to move forward uh, was different, right? They they required to have a, another shuttle uh, on the pad ready to go to rescue the the the, the first shuttle, the primary mission, um, and we had to have the ability on board the space station to to actually serve as a safe haven for the shuttle crew to allow them a, a safe haven to stay until the rescue shuttle could come up and rescue them. So that had big impacts on our program. One, we had to have enough resources, enough capacity on board our uh, vehicle on, on board the International Space Station to handle. Um, seven additional bodies, um, which is a, is a huge deal. Station was not sized for for that magnitude, um, and we are in the process of trying to grow from a three-person crew to a seven-person or to a six-person crew, which would mean maximum we could have a, a, a size of thir of of, uh, of a seven plus six, thirteen people on board. So we could have quite a few people, which would tax the environmental control and life support systems. It could tax the the amount of food and the amount of water on board. Plus, we had to manage all those resources, uh, and so we, we endeavored to do that. Um, it, it, had, had, it had a significant impact because we had to keep these cash of stores on board. We always had to manage that actively. Um, we were in a, such a, in, in a great place that uh, we had enough stores on board. We had the capacity to store them. But we had to actively manage them, and then, of course, when we grew from a three-person crew to a six-person crew, that added uh, additional tax. Eventually, we got to the point where we no longer... Uh, it also required, I should say, that the, the shuttle had the flights spaced close together, which, which was a problem too. And so we ultimately got to the point where we could space the shuttle flights a little longer. We could 
uh, manage uh, the stores by actually having the ability to fly a Progress or another resupply vehicle in that interim, and and uh, and still uh, we knew we had a, a very successful plan to keep the, the shuttle crew uh, safe and healthy until a rescue shuttle could come up. All that worked perfectly up until the very last flight. Of course, you get to the point where you say, well, the last flight's going to fly. Do you prepare a rescue flight for that vehicle? And in this case, we did not. We finally got to the point where where we actually decided to go look at flying the shuttle crew members down on Soyuz vehicles if, in the event that the last shuttle flight had some damage and, and could not safely return the crew. We actually worked with our Russian partners to create this plan and had a successful plan, although I'll tell you that the, the, one of the, the longest staying shuttle crew member would have to stay on board the International Space Station an additional year before they could get a ride home. But worked out that plan, worked with our partners, and, uh, and thankfully we didn't have to execute that plan. Okay. Uh, so some have asked, uh, should, should we have had a rescue flight or this mentality of having a rescue flight uh, all along in the International Space Station program? Or should we have always had a rescue shuttle on the pad to rescue the crew members on the first flight? Um, and I would tell you that the, the real reason for that is risk, uh, risk assessment and then risk mitigation. Uh, up to the Columbia accident, uh, our assessment, and I say ours, I'm not talking about the International Space Station program, I'm talking about in NASA and the shuttle, really the nation, our assessment was that, that the risk of losing a, a shuttle um, once it's on orbit, uh, from on orbit down through landing, was, was small. And, and therefore, it didn't warrant the expenditure of resources to always have another shuttle on the pad ready to go. And so... Some would say, well, should we do that? Should we have done that? And should we do that in future programs? And, and I would say it's really back to, the, uh, back to that same idea, risk assessment. What is the risk and, and how should we deploy our resources to actively manage the, the, all the risks on the program, not just this one risk? So what we did wrong at that point in time was we did not understand completely the risk to the shuttle in this ascent debris environment to, to the, the foam shedding off of the tank uh, and other sources of debris and what it could mean to a shuttle being able to safely um, return to, to Earth and land. And so we didn't understand that risk, and so we weren't mitigating it appropriately. When we returned to flight, we understood that risk significantly better. Plus, we'd taken some additional mitigation steps to reduce that risk. And therefore, uh, because we saw, we saw it as a much higher risk, then we took the, the I would say, enormous expenditures to, uh, to have a rescue shuttle there. Uh, that's a significant resource hit both to the shuttle program and to the International Space Station program. In the future, I wouldn't just jump to that conclusion because when you're spending money on resolving this risk or mitigating this particular risk, there are dozens, perhaps other risks that might even be more significant that you are not deploying resources. Resources are always precious and, and, uh, and therefore you have to deploy them to the highest risk. So I would recommend that programs in the future, again, assess all their risks and decide how, how best to do that. The key is continually going back and looking at those risks even the ones that are not your number one risk, to see if did I understand them correctly? Um, are the, have they grown over time? Is our understanding of those changed? Has other factors in the environment changed uh, that, that would change my overall risk assessment and where I would deploy my resources? But I wouldn't always plan on having a rescue flight for humans uh, sitting there on the pad. I, I don't think that'll pop. It's, that's, that's probably the best use of our, uh, our resources. And as we go on to exploration, when you're talking about launching a, a huge rocket like the, the, the Space Launch System with an Orion capsule on board, uh, there's only one launch pad. Uh, our ability to, to build rockets of that size and Orions of that size uh, is limited. And, and, and even our ability to fly a rescue flight would be um, nearly impossible so, um, uh, or prohibitively expensive. So again, we need to understand those risks and, and then deploy our resources appropriately. Um, my sense is for exploration, that won't be having a rescue flight sitting on the pad, uh, but that'll be for, for the future generations to decide. After the Columbia accident and, uh, and the decision to retire the shuttle, um, that had a significant impact on the International Space Station budget. What, what, were the, what, what was our plan before? And now what will our new plan have to be? And it had significant budgetary impact. So our plan before, uh, we had a budget profile looking out over the years. Um, 
and and we were aggressively working to to bring that profile down as we as we completed the assembly of ISS and we understood it better we would be able to maintain it and and sustain it at, at lower and lower cost every year at least that was our plan uh, and our idea was when uh, there, there's there's literally thousands of of, of parts that would uh, that, that could wear out or fail on board the ISS our plan was to actually bring them home repair them fly them back so we had a relatively few number of spares sitting on the ground because it was just a matter of time before we could get it home on a shuttle repair it fly it back up on the next shuttle and we're good when we decided to retire the shuttle now all of a sudden we have to go build some of these spares so we actually have to go in and re-enter in manufacturing in a number of, of, of uh, very expensive devices and, and the issues there were, one, the production lines shut down, and so the companies have moved on. The, the people who built them and the machines and all the instructions and the test equipment, all those things had to be resurrected. And then there's obsolescence. So the part that you used, in particular, electronic parts. The electronic parts that you used five years ago um, don't exist today. They, they've moved on and have better parts, but they're different. So you have to change the design of these of these uh, uh, devices that we're going to use on ISS. So we had significant costs to go to go restart production lines, um, and and uh, so we had to factor that into our uh, into our budget. In addition, when a device failed, we would throw it away. Um, in, in the future, we are th we are throwing it away rather than bringing it home. So now, on a cost savings point, we get to close down the depots on the ground. The guys who are ready to go repair our uh, devices, so we didn't no longer had to incur that cost. Uh, and then, probably the singularly largest cost was now to, to launch cargo up to the International Space Station. Uh, we decided to go with commercial companies to go fly our our cargo to the ISS. A shuttle flight uh, could carry um, say thirty thousand. Uh, 30,000 pounds up to uh, up to ISS of that in terms of useful cargo was was less than that probably in the neighborhood of 12 to 15,000 pounds of useful cargo but it cost a half a billion dollars to go fly a shuttle we were looking for a significant change in the cost uh, per pound of, of cargo to ISS so we opened up a commercial a contract, and I, I asked any company that would like to go to go bid on this. We ultimately selected two companies, SpaceX and Orbital Sciences, uh, to go uh, to go fly uh, cargo to the International Space Station, and uh, and we are now in the process of of those guys actually flying cargo to and from uh, to and from ISS. So that was a significant change in our budget in the space station budget. We actually didn't carry any cost for transportation. That was all carried in the shuttle program. Now all of a sudden we had a significant um, increase to our budget to cover the cost to these commercial companies to fly our cargo. And finally, our plan previous previous to the retirement of the shuttle was to fly crew members to and from the space station to rotate them um, on board the inter uh, on board the space shuttle. Now, of course, we can't do that. So in the interim, our plan was to fly them on Soyuz, and we have to actually procure those Soyuz seats from, uh, from the, uh, the Russians until NASA or the United States created another launch system where we could fly humans to low Earth orbit. Um, and, and we're in the throes of that. Uh, now we're looking for uh, the same type of commercial approach, entering with commercial companies to fly uh, crew members to and from ISS. In the meantime, we have to continue to buy those seats from the uh, literally the only other place in the world to uh, to fly humans to uh, to our space station is is in Russia. So we we enter in negotiations uh, uh, periodically to go buy seats for the next year or two, and uh, and as we our commercial companies are getting ready to go fly humans, we'll go marry those up so that we continually have the ability to fly our crew members to to ISS. Again, that's a significant upper to our budget. Previously, the, the cost of flying humans to move from low Earth orbit was in the shuttle. Now it's on, on ISS. So while we were, prior to the, the, the announcement of the retirement of the shuttle, we were aggressively working to reduce our budget. Now, all of a sudden, <coughs> we went from a $2 billion program to a $4 billion program. So significant impact. For, uh, for us to manage. So some of the lessons that we learned in that in that budget was, uh, era uh, and our drastic changes to our budget. One is we uh, when you're a program and you're used to, to, to procurement of, in our case, $2 billion, and now you're jumping to $4 billion, that's a huge surge in the system. And so how do you grow very quickly uh, to go to go do that, so we had to. You can't just go higher, double your the, the number of people working. That doesn't work. Uh, you have to ease them into the system, and so uh, 
that's one thing we had to go work through. Uh, really think through how do you grow from you know our size to another size? How do you be as efficient? So instead of growing 100%, we tried to grow 25%, and 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 we grew grew a little bit, see if that was enough, and then we would grow more. So that was a that was a big deal to us. The 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 bigger lessons though were in were in how do we how do we capture all the the knowledge when we're building up our devices? How do we manage the obsolescence of it? Uh, and and then ultimately, how do we manage the decision to to keep a depot on the ground or to to, to have this philosophy where we'll we'll throw things throw things away. And so today we have a much more aggressive uh, obsolescence program. Every, uh, uh, we call them ORU, orbital replacement unit, we actually continually look with all the suppliers and all the piece parts in those ORUs and say, hey, this one's now going to be obsolete. obsolete. Should we go buy some of those parts before they disappear from the store shelves? Or should we just let it go and we know we'll redesign this ORU at some point in the future? So we have a very aggressive uh, obsolescence program today. And I think that's really important for a, a long duration program is up front, you have to know to look for those obsolescence because if something changes in the future and you have to build more or repair more often than you anticipated, you have to have those parts in your hand or incur a, a, sometimes a very significant build to go do the engineering to, to modify or, or, or even redesign completely that, that particular ORU. The other thing was how do you go through and make sure you capture all the special test equipment, all the test procedures, uh, even all the factory notes to to go build up some more uh, ORUs. And so in the beginning we thought, well, we're going to build a few of these and we're done. We'll go. We'll take all the the, the equipment and the, the documentation and we'll go put it in a warehouse, but we're never going to use it again. We're just doing that just to be safe. And then of course. That wasn't the case. We actually pulled a lot of that back out. Frankly, today we're even pulling some of it out and, and uh, reusing it. So uh, in a long duration program, it's very, very important that you take the time and spend the resource to put that, that equipment away and and uh, and that you, you maintain it if it requires maintaining and that you actually capture the documentation so that you can bring those things back out of, uh, out of uh, stores if you need them. Uh, or you ex expend a tremendous number of resources to go recreate it, to go really understand how it is to go assemble one of these devices. Um, and so that was a big, uh, a big lesson for us. And so we're much better today about transferring that factory equipment and what do we do and have a very, uh, a very good plan, I believe, about how we consolidate that and store it and maintain it uh, over time. And, of course, you look for efficiencies, too, uh, as you go. So th those are the big drivers for us uh, as a result of this. Um, and uh, uh, as a result of this this decision, they were really budget driven. We knew we had to increase our budget, but we didn't want to just automatically double everything. Uh, we want to do it as efficiently as, as we could. One of the important <clears throat> things that changed after uh, after the shuttle retirement was the impact to spacewalks and to uh, robotic operations, and really, I'll say even maintenance on board the space station. Um, Prior to the shuttle uh, retirement, we had a, a crew of seven, uh, typically, uh, and they would come up for and stay docked for approximately a week to the space station. And these seven people would be trained for a year or longer to go do very specialized tasks on the uh, on the space station, and even the order of those tasks. So there was a whole choreography. I used to think of it as a ballet. They would uh, they would work on this uh, this ballet for a year, then they'd get up there. And they would go execute this ballet. And they were very, very efficient. They knew just what to do, just how to do it. They had the tools with them. They had all the piece parts, and they'd go do this. And they were extremely efficient during those seven days. In fact, they worked very, very hard, very long days, um, and not really a sustainable pace. But they're only up there for seven days. They do it. They undock and, and come home, and they, can, and they can rest. And so the benefit to the ISS program was we got a tremendous amount of work done. In fact, we would save it up until these crews came. Well, the same is true for spacewalks. So if something would break, we could conceivably send the crew members who were living aboard ISS out. <clears throat> but these guys could have had not their last EVA or spacewalk training could have been six to eight months previous to this. So they were they'd have to go relearn 
uh, refresh their memories in a way of how to operate the suit and how to safely do it. They also had to learn all the tasks they were doing and how to translate those tasks and all the tether protocols and all those little minute details that are extremely important to do a, a successful EVA. They'd have to learn those in a very short period of time. And when they're learning it, it's taking away from the things they could be doing in terms of particularly utilization on board space station. And so our philosophy before a shuttle retirement was give all that to the shuttle crew members. We'll train them up and have them be extremely efficient, extremely well-versed on those tasks, and they could, do, they could do them very quickly. So in terms of spacewalks, it would be 30% to 50% more efficient for a shuttle crew member to go do a spacewalk and do these list of tasks than it would be to have somebody who is currently living on board ISS and say, hey, go do these list of tasks. And it's because they could do six runs in the neutral buoyancy lab here on the shuttle crew members could do six runs on the NBL here on the ground and perfect all the techniques, the body positions, all those little details that take time, uh, how exact translation paths, all that could be done and, and just beat into your head, frankly. Uh, on board, you can't do that. There's no, there's no ability to go do those things. And if you tried to do them by studying day after day after day, then you're not doing something else, kind of an opportunity cost. So tremendous benefit to the space station program of having these shuttle flights with seven crew members. Now we retire, now there's no ability to do the, those anymore. The, the guys who go out and do spacewalks to repair any devices or to, to, to change the configuration outside of the space station have to learn it while they're up there. When they're going through their training, they're going through a training and, and they learn basic tasks, but they don't understand or they don't know at the time what EVAs they're going to do and how those tasks fit together to create the EVA. So we train all that on board these days. And we allow them extra time to go execute those tasks uh, as compared with our tradition on board shuttles because they haven't been trained six times to do a specific EVA. They, in some cases, they've been trained three or four days before to go, to go do the EVA on board with products and, and some of the electronic tools we have. So that's a big change. Uh, but we, we, it changed not only how we do it on board, but it also changes how we train the crew members, the ISS crew members, before they even go on board. So we give them a lot of familiarization, familiarization of the suit and basic tasks that they're going to do, basic tether protocols, how to, how to execute the, all the elements of spacewalks. And in fact, we even identified what we call the Big 12, the big, uh, the most critical things that could fail externally, we actually train them in repairing or replacing those particular devices uh, so that they're well-versed in that. If they should fail, they can, they can go execute those tasks very efficiently. Uh, so a, a big far-reaching impact to how we, uh, to how we do it. And, and I talked a lot about EVA. Really, robotics is, again, similar. You have to train basic robotic skills, but as far as what specific robotics tasks you're going to do, you don't know it until you're actually on board and something fails and you have to go do it. So uh, uh, we actually have ability to provide some very uh, focused training when they're on board, um, but do a lot of skills-based training before they go so that we're prepared to go learn uh, the, the actual task uh, once they're on orbit. And we've been very successful in that. Um, without having to uh, utilize too much of the crew time on board and, and still uh, able to use the crew time majority for, uh, for research and utilization, which was why we built the space station. Uh, is there a lesson to be passed down to future generations as a result of this? And, and the, the situation was we had planned this way. We were actually training our crews with a certain mindset, a certain ops concept, if you will, and now all of a sudden we had to change it, and we did. And we're very successful in that. And so I think that the message going forward uh, to people is uh, know that you have to create an ops concept and you have to train, but know that, they're, that you're going to change it over time. And in fact, you might change it very significantly at a specific time, which is really what happened to us. That's okay. So know that you have to be adaptable uh, going in. And in fact, the, the more you embrace the fact that you're going to change over time, I think the easier it is. So if you start, here's our plan, here's how we're going to train. But by the way, we know we're going to change. You're, then you're automatically looking for that change as, as, as uh, every day. Literally every day you're looking for better ways, more efficient ways of, of doing this. And I think it's a great mindset to have uh, going forward. I think it'll be really important for the, for the future programs to have that. So on board the ISS, we have a number of resources that are required to, to keep it to keep it and the humans on board uh, alive and healthy and fully functioning. And we had a plan for, for how to resupply these logistics. And it's things like oxygen, um, 
perhaps carbon dioxide removal, uh, water, uh, you know, waste collection and, and removal, uh, shirts, t-shirts, uh, and then it's, of course, the utilization, all those things. We couldn't launch with, with say, 15 years' worth of those things on board. Our plan always was to launch them and to remove trash along the way. And so uh, that obviously was affected prior to shuttle, when we're flying shuttles normally. Now, all of a sudden, we're going to retire shuttles. Now, how does that, how does that change? And so we had, we had this idea of skip cycle uh, from the very beginning of the program. We knew that the shuttle uh, could delay. We knew that the shuttle, because of weather and mechanical issues, it might not fly on this date. It might fly 30 days later. Well, the same would be true for, uh, for uncrewed vehicles, in particular the, the progress vehicles the Russians were going to fly. They might uh, either be delayed or we might, one of those might not be successful. So we wanted to have enough reserves on board ISS to protect for those cases. And so we actively managed it. We established a requirement. And in fact, we argued about was that the requirement, right requirement or should be more or less. And we've evolved that over time. Now, all of a sudden, shuttle retires. We have new resupply vehicles that are coming online, both from uh, the European Space Agency and the Japanese Space Agency. But they... Uh, at the time, I had only flown one time, and we weren't very confident in their ability. Plus, we had signed these contracts with commercial entities to fly vehicles. At a certain date, they were actually doing the design of the vehicle, so we thought it likely that they wouldn't meet those dates. And then when they do, can they fly as often as we, uh, we expect them to? So we actually, <clears throat> as we neared retirement, we actually changed our philosophy for that transition period. We actually decided to fly, and in fact, the last shuttle flight was to go bring up a tremendous amount of extra spare parts and extra supply, food, water, and so on, so that we were in a position to allow those other flights to, uh, to change. So we, if, in, in a more concrete fashion, we had a skip cycle requirement that was here. Now shuttles are going to retire. We're going to rely on these new vehicles. We actually go up to a much higher reserve that's required on board ISS to allow us some margin for the, the, the schedule to slip for these new guys. And as we become confident in this supply chain, then we'll bring that back down. And so uh, the lesson there is, again, you have to think for uh, what resources you need on board in terms of reserve and what your spares, uh, you know, what, what uh, uh, additional capability you need to have uh, and know that that might change over time. One, you want to be most efficient as you can, but also know that the, the, the external environment might change and, and have to change it. I'll tell you the one thing that we learned through all this, uh, we were so focused at the beginning of the programs, we were assembling and, and, and moving forward. We were very focused on having enough food and water. And, and, and in fact, there are times in the program when both of those were extremely critical. Oxygen, we almost you know, had times where we were almost to the red line on all these, these things. And so we were so struggling with those things. What we were not worried about at all turned out to be probably our biggest problem was trash. So as you bring cargo up, you fill these vehicles, the shuttle and now our cargo resupply vehicles, very efficiently. You have a, you know dozens of people here on the ground who are packing these bags, and they're very efficient how they put the devices and all the, the packing material in a bag, and we fly it. Well, now it goes up, up to orbit, and now we have to repack those bags. And so we found that the bags... Even though the same size volume coming down carries significantly less mass than it did going up. So if you always fly your supply vehicle up full, over time the space station will get more and more full, more full, more full, and eventually it'll fill up where you can't even uh, operate anymore. And so we found that, that actually trash removal, having a vehicle on board station to throw, those tra throw, throw trash away, and in some cases launching a vehicle not completely volumetrically full so that we could bring down additional volume of trash was extremely important. And so now going forward, I would tell you that uh, it's important for future programs to, to think through all the resources that you need, uh, and, and that's in, you know consumables, but as well, as well as spare parts. Don't carry any more than you need, but make sure you have enough. Uh, that's pretty simple. But the big thing is think about the other side of the equation, getting things off. So even in exploration, there are going to be things on board the vehicle that you'll want to get away from. You don't want to have waste uh, on, board, I, uh, on board your vehicle forever. Uh, things just like the food containers, you're going to want to throw away uh, and, and get away. So you have to actively manage what you're going to do with your trash having adequate stowage volume for your trash, and a way to get it away from the vehicle. So even if you're talking about a vehicle that's going 
one way, you know, a long way, you know, out beyond the moon, uh, you're going to want to have a way to throw away trash and get it off the vehicle, outside, and, and away, from the, uh, away from the humans. So a, a big lesson, I think, that we learned along the way. Contingency planning for a program like uh, the space station is really important. Um, uh, but I tell you, the, the contingency planning or the types of things that you think about uh, that, are, that can hit you uh, are different depending upon the phase of the program. So initially, uh, we had the, uh, the first element of the ISS uh, it was called the FGB. It was actually manufactured in Russia, but it was contracted from, from NASA. Um, so uh, it was ready to go but you had to make sure the next pieces were ready to go. The next piece was actually a, no a node that was going to manufacture in the U.S. It was ready to go, but the real heart and soul of the initial parts of the ISS was the service module to be manufactured at the expense of the Russian government, and it was a year, actually more than a year away. And so uh, we decided to actually hold those first pieces on the ground, um, and even then, in NASA, we were concerned that the service module wouldn't ever be ready. So we actually develop contingency plans to go continue to execute our program if the service module doesn't fly. We also looked at contingency plans if every one of the elements, or any one of the elements, I should say, along the line was not successful. How would we continue on with the program? So initially we're looking at big chunks of the space station not making up there, not being successful in, in performing their function. That was a big deal to us. Uh, now, all of a sudden, the shuttle, we have the, the Columbia accident, and now the shuttle uh, is having its own issues. So now our focus is on the contingency. Well, what happens if the shuttle's damaged, and how do we keep those the, the crew members on board until a rescue shuttle can come up? And so our focus now was more on the human side. How do we, how do we deal with all those people on board as, uh, ISS? How do we make sure they can survive until another vehicle comes up? We also make sure that the systems, we were worried very much about the systems. Would they function? Our ability to repair those systems, in particular the ones that are necessary to sustain the life of all these humans in, in, this, uh, in this time frame. And now as we go forward, <clears throat> now we've, we've survived the, the shuttle retirement. Now the, the contingencies are, okay, what happens if we have to decrew space station for a while? How can we keep space station alive? Because a big part of, uh, of keeping the, the, the station alive is being able to repair or replace broken parts when they fail. When something fails in the cooling system, <clears throat> we don't have a tremendous amount of redundancy. Our plan is, oh, a pump failed. We replaced the pump and we're good. So we have short-term redundancy, but not intended for months and years. Um, and so we now focus a lot of attention on how to deal with, with that contingency. So the message here, I think, or the, the thing to think about is focus on the contingencies depending upon the phase of your program and know that they're going to evolve over time. So when your program reaches another phase or about to enter another phase, um, you need to go back and reevaluate what is it that what are the contingencies we're planning for and what are the most important ones to us and go spend your resources to go really understand those contingencies and what your response would be to those contingencies. And uh, that's something that, that uh, we're doing even today. We're reevaluating what those contingencies are and, and building plans. So a big lesson for future programs. As the shuttle was nearing retirement, um, uh, we started looking at how do we capture the resources from the shuttle program, the ones that would be beneficial to the ISS. How do we capture those things and make sure that, uh, that we make maximum use of the shuttle program, not just in terms of it flying an element to ISS, but really everything. So we got to those last few flights, and we would go, uh, the shuttle's getting ready to undock, and we'd start looking at all the cargo on board the shuttle. What's left on the shuttle that they don't need for those day or two before they, after they undock and before they return to Earth? that they could give us. So we would typically take, uh, we would take resources, uh, like for instance, they would have these canisters that would scrub carbon dioxide in a, in a contingency. We'd say, well, give us all the ones that you didn't use that you thought you were going to, give them to us, and we'd put them on board ISS. Laptops, uh, uh, literally anything, printers, um, anything, food, <laughs> that, that wasn't absolutely necessary from the shuttle that we could make use of on ISS, um, and we knew we'd have to launch sometime in the future. It's much better to take it now. It's already here. We don't have to pay the launch cost anymore. So we would capture those things. And, and we would go through a scrub every time because the shuttle didn't launch with excess uh, equipment or, or even excess food or consumables. They had a plan 
<clears throat> but there's margin on that plan, and they have to protect for contingencies on their side. When those contingencies did not occur, now all of a sudden they do have excess. So it wasn't they had excess before they launched. It was at the time they're getting ready to undock, we'd go evaluate what the shuttle absolutely needed and what was excess, and would that excess be of benefit to us. And in some cases, we actually got some equipment that wasn't considered excess from from shuttle. A perfect example of that is they had this, this boom with some sensors on to look at the underside of the shuttle. They only flew one of these, and they used it to inspect uh, after launch, but before docking to ISS, they'd inspect the, the critical regions of the shuttle. And after undock, they would inspect again to make sure they didn't take a debris hit, a, a, a micrometeorite or orbital debris hit before they came in. But we thought we knew, in fact, I said we thought we actually knew that a boom like this uh, would be extremely beneficial to to ISS in the case of a contingency. And in fact, we actually used that boom when the shuttle was docked to go repair a solar array, an area that would be impossible to get a crew member uh, to to repair without some kind of an extension. So in that case, we actually took a piece of equipment that wasn't spare or excess from the shuttle and kept it on board the ISS. So the shuttle flew up, we grabbed that boom, attached it to the ISS, and the shuttle had to leave and, and land without doing that final in inspection. So. Um, all really important things to, to think about. Uh, you know, how do you capture anything that's available up there as, as part of your program? We even went so as far as the people. Uh, the, the last few years, shuttle and station got to understand each other's constraints really, really well. <clears throat> and as they neared uh, completion of fly out of the shuttle, the, the number of people they needed went down. But uh, we knew we had a big hill to climb with, uh, with bringing on these commercial vehicles and uh, and. Uh, working with our international partners now to carry all our cargo and our crew up and down, we actually could take the people who were working those similar problems with us and understood all our constraints, all our issues. We could take them and move them over seamlessly to work in our program. Where they were working shuttle transportation to ISS, they could turn around and work commercial cargo uh, transportation to ISS just very seamlessly. When they were working how to sequence the flights between shuttle to ISS, now all of a sudden they can work progresses and Soyuzes and, and European ATVs and Japanese HTVs to the station. So these people were actually very, very uh, useful to us and, and their uh, tasks for going away. So I think the message for future programs is look look for these opportunities. It wasn't planned in uh, initially. Of course, we didn't really plan on, on the shuttle retiring when our program was conceived. The ISS was dreamed up and, and was actually constructed to fly only on shuttle and then we had to adapt to it. Uh, as that adaption came, there was actually resources that were available to us cheaper, cheaper than we could go out and get those anywhere else. And so it was a great benefit. We got this wealth of experience from the other program. All the issues that they had worked on before automatically became part of our knowledge base. Plus, we didn't have to train new people, so it was actually cheaper for us to get these people across that way. Uh, a big benefit and, and something that we didn't plan um, just an opportunity that came along, and, and we were fortunate very much to, uh, to capture that opportunity. What are the big takeaways from, from, the, uh, from the, uh, the space shuttle uh, program? What, you know, what did we learn as a result of that in its retirement and its impact on, uh, on other programs? And, and one of the things to me personally was the station was started and actually started when I was, uh, they were thinking about it when I came to work here in the, in the 80s. Uh, shuttle was already flying, <clears throat> started designing the, the, the station, and it went away and then came back, and, 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 and I guess we finally got serious about it in the early 90s. But by then, the shuttle had already been flying for, for 15 years. And so our plan was to build this station with many, many shuttle flights, 44 shuttle flights. And... Uh, but if you looked at the, how many we expected to fly, say five a year, and how many years the shuttle had already flown, did it really make sense to, to actually be able to fly all those flights, all those additional years? And then, by the way, that's just a symbol. And then the station would fly beyond that for, for research. All, all the elements of the ISS were designed to fly up and down. Our concept in terms of spares was to fly uh, things up and down. Our crews were to be rotated. The utilization, the science experiments were all to be done, and then the results and even sometimes the equipment brought back down to the ground. The whole program, which was going to have a 15-year and perhaps beyond lifetime on itself, was built on this idea that shuttle was going to be there. But if you really sit down and think, 
does it make sense? Could could uh, could the shuttle vehicle itself last that many years? And then could NASA or we as a nation want to spend the resources for that program in addition to ISS for that many years? So the answer might maybe may a is is a possibly, but you have to think that, that there's a possibility it also wouldn't. And so I think the thing we should have done in, the, in that time frame was think about, well, what are our options if the shuttle wasn't going to be there? How do we continue on with a productive and viable program if the shuttle wasn't going to be there? We ended up doing that, but more out of a necessity, I would say, than, than a prior plan. And so uh, we probably should have seen, seen the, 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 the time skew of those things such that uh, it's a very likely possibility that shuttle would not be there by the end of the ISS program. Um, and so, uh, so there you go. Uh, I think that's a, that's a, okay. uh, a big. Uh, so uh, a second takeaway was that the space shuttle uh, itself was not only important to us, uh, to ISS, in terms of how we, how we actually would uh, assemble and utilize and resupply the space station, but it's very important uh, to, our, to our international partners. Uh, one, their elements were actually designed uniquely to fit into a shuttle. Uh, they really couldn't be without without almost a complete redesign launched on any other vehicle in the world, um, and certainly mass wise, there was no other launch vehicle for them to uh, to fly on. So their their pieces, their elements, had to fly on shuttle. But probably even more important, their 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 crew members, each one of these partners, had flight opportunities, and they expected their partner their crew members to be able to fly up on the shuttle and down on the shuttle, and so. Uh, and to some extent, they, they even though we, we think of it as a U.S. vehicle, they had an identity with the space shuttle. And so uh, not only did they have crew members that flew up to station and lived there, they saw the potential for opportunities to fly crew members just up and down on a shuttle flight. Perhaps the shuttle flight was going to deliver their element. And I can tell you uh, from working with the partners, having their crew members uh, on board uh, and, and in space is a huge th thing. In fact, it's hard for us to understand in the United States today because having astronauts in space is something that we've had for many, many years here, and we don't have the, nat the, the national excitement about one of our crew members flying. It's completely different in other parts of the world. Today, in Canada, there's a Canadian astronaut who's, uh, who's the commander of, uh, of the ISS, and all through Canada, there's tremendous excitement about having their their astronaut on board ISS, and in particular being the commander of this, uh, of, of the space station. The same is true about having their astronaut on board the shuttle. So the, the rest of the world having the shuttle was, was, was really, really important. Uh, and the third thing was, um, so we had this accident with, with the Columbia, and it had tremendous, we talked about technical and scientific and really emotional imp impacts to, uh, to our country um, and, and, and to the ISS as well. But one of the things that, that we didn't see uh, initially, uh, before the shuttle, we were arguing with our partners, and, and we, were, we were partners, but it was uh, not an overly close relationship. So we were always, you know, we, we always had disagreements, and, and sometimes these disagreements would last for a very long time to, to, to overcome, and it was very difficult. Now, all of a sudden, uh, in one day, the, we have the we have the uh, the Columbia accident, and immediately everyone realizes. Well, now, the the primary means of rotating crew members, the primary means of assembling and resupplying the station is gone. How do we keep the space station alive? How do we keep how do we keep humans going up there? How do we keep people alive up there? How do we continue utilizing the space station? And we immediately pulled together as a partnership, and uh, and it was actually a tremendous thing, and it even resonates today years after, after that accident, over a decade after that accident. Uh, the partnership is much, much closer today. And we know that when times come, get tough, when the, when the really tough times come, that we'll, we'll pull together. And so today, we actually function much better um, uh, as a partnership and as a program mm -hmm. as a result of that accident. So uh, you know, it's, it's unfortunate that we had it, uh, and, uh, and, and I don't know how you do this for, for uh, uh, I don't even know how you'd create this kind of uh, relationship in the future. I can just tell you that as we go forward and we create relationships uh, to do a future program, we're going to have another program with Russia or with, uh, uh, with the European countries in ESA, with Japan and with, with Canada. We know today there is no doubt 
that when we need to pull together, that we can. And so the, 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 one of the, the positive things out of this is that we knew for ISS, we learned through ISS, and we know going forward into the future that we can count on, on our partners when, when the time is tough, and they can count on us. So uh, a really important lesson to, uh, to have learned. You know, I talked a little bit about the, the, uh, the, the equipment and the people who've who've come to uh, to live on uh, or come to be part of ISS to come work on ISS and there, but but really uh, the the station wouldn't exist today. It, it would not be conceived of. It wouldn't be possible to build something of the magnitude of of the space station. It weighs close to a million pounds. It's the size of a, of an American football field or a, or a soccer pitch, if you will. Uh, something of that magnitude could not be built by uh, launching individual rockets and trying to assemble it on space, in space. It really could only be built with something like a space shuttle that goes up there and has a crew, crew there, they can assemble it. It really can be only done that way. Um, and so when we look up in space and see the space station fly by, in fact, it'll fly by, uh, by uh, Houston this evening, you can look up there and see it and know that, that uh, even though the shuttle was retired, all the people who worked on the space shuttle program and, uh, and the shuttle itself really has made that possible. It's part of the International Space Station. It's part of the heart, the soul, the history, um, and really uh, the, the existence of the uh, International Space Station. Um, and so I know I look at it every day when it flies by and think about, uh, about all those people, about that program, about those vehicles even, that, that made it possible. And, uh, and I can't see the space station without, uh, without seeing the space shuttle. Um, It'll be a part of the ISS all the way to the end of the ISS program.